All right, so let's make a full introduction for our listeners. Good afternoon, Stephen. Uh, my name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the studios in Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Stephen uh, Gustafson accepted our invitation to our show. Hey, Stephen, welcome to the show, man. Hi, Claudio. Thank you for having me. No, oh, quite the, the opposite. It's a pleasure for me. So let, let's start a little bit of what's going on in the world, though in terms of politics. I don't, I don't want to talk about Russia and Ukraine because it was crazy. But with the COVID, you know, with the COVID, we have got the COVID for the last two years. So if you're touring musician, you couldn't tour. You know, uh, if you, some in some profession you were affected and it had been crazy. And then little by little, you know, more gigs are happening. Bands, many bands disappear because they couldn't pay the bills. They're doing something different yeah. for a living. And and, uh, and some bands stayed. And uh, so we am very lucky that at least here in DC, we're able to see more show. How how the COVID has affected you, your your family, your sanity? How are you holding up? Man? Um, I welcomed it. Yeah. Um, I um, you know we travel for a living, and uh, I'll, I'll be sixty five years old in April tenth, and uh, you know we've been doing it for forty years, and. Um, while I, I enjoy playing um, for people and and just playing the guitar, playing the instruments, um, making music, um, I don't particularly like traveling much anymore. Uh, uh, it's nice to go to new places that we haven't been. And there are certainly, uh, you know, we'd love to get back to the UK and Europe uh, should the opportunity arise. But... Um, <clears throat> I'm a homebody. I like being at home and I have, uh, I own 70 acres of land and I built my house there in, uh, in 1993. Um, uh, and I like being there in, in the woods and at home. And, um, in 20, in October of, um, 2020, my daughter, our, our youngest child, uh, got married at our house. So, I spent that entire summer, you know, it was an outdoor wedding. So I did a lot of, I cut trees down and, uh, and, you know, made more lawn and I worked on the house and we redid some of the wood floors and, uh, you know, did some painting and just getting ready to host guests. And, um, uh, I, I was very happy doing that. Um, and I, I actually almost reached a point, um, where I thought I didn't want to go out and play music anymore, where I was very happy just to be home and be retired and play golf and go skiing and, you know, and see my children. Um, but, you know, we, I think we had some unfinished business as far as the band goes. And one, we, we, it was very difficult for us to write new music you know, when we're on the road a lot, we, we don't do that very well. We have to be focused in our studio. Um, so what the pandemic did was it gave us that time to do that. Um, and while some of our band members live in Buffalo, New York, um, the band's hometown is Jamestown, New York, about 70 miles south of Buffalo. So it sometimes it's not always easy getting, you know, all six band members together to, to work. But we, we did that and we recorded about 24 basic tracks, demos for new material, new songs. And so we're slowly um, working on those when we have enough, we have time when we can, um, you know, take our gear out of the truck and set it up in our studio and uh, do basic tracks, do overdubs. You know, we haven't started the mixing process yet or but it's coming, it's a slow process. And at first I was a little frustrated about that, that it was just taking so long, but it is what it is. And um, uh, then in June of 2021, we had some outdoor shows, which was, um, it was good to get back and play in front of people again, because you know, ultimately, I think what musicians like more than anything his applause, right? Well, His applause. And, um, you know, it, there's really, it's a, it's a very unique feeling to have a room full of people 
stand up and yell and scream, you know, in joy. And, mm -hmm. and, and they're, they just feel so good. And they're dancing and laughing and singing. And the feeling that that <clears throat> creates in a room full of 500 people um, is just, it's, it's stimulating. You know, it makes your adrenaline, you know, flood your body and all the endorphins. And it, it's a real, it's a drug. Um, and, you know, we like that. And in September, we did a few more outdoor shows. And then in October, November of 2021, we did a little tour uh, sort of along the East Coast. I think that's where I saw you at the Birchmere. That's right, um, yeah. Uh, uh, and, you know, the... The, the six band members, you know, we all love each other. We're all friends. Mm. Um, we're friends with our crew. Some of our crew are family. My son works for us. Our keyboard player, Dennis Drew, his son works for us. You know, so it's, it's a really tight knit group of people and we all enjoy our time together on the road. Um, uh, you know, being successful at the end of the, after all the work the crew does to set up the gear and, and to, you know, and that, well, the time to travel there and then doing sound check. And then finally you get to do the show. And when we know we've, we feel like we've played well and the audience responds to that, um, you know, it's, that's successful to us. Yeah. And I enjoy, I enjoy meeting our fans, you know, uh, we've got really good fans and they're really kind people. Um, uh, and I enjoy talking with them and that. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I, it, the pandemic didn't bother me at all. I kept my sanity. Um, I got vaccinated. Uh, I got COVID, <laughs> um, uh, which wasn't very bad. But, um, uh, you know, we're kind of glad. We're sort of happy that there seems to be a light at the end of the tunnel, you know. And we're finally um, fine. Yeah. booking yeah, booking more shows and uh, getting back to the Birchmere again and yeah. you know which is one of the great one of the great venues in the country we love playing there yeah yeah and the people that go there as we talked before and uh, um, they they really love you guys in the area I mean since I'm in the border with Maryland and, uh, and Washington see every every band every literally every band come this way you know people here in Washington have a high you know disposable income that can see a lot of shows like myself and uh they like music in this area. So every every band, big bands, a small band, starting people that are starting out there, they do very well here. And uh, they're very receptive to music. And you guys do very well. I mean, uh, you know, it's different. You know, over the years from 80s until now, some people in the band have come and gone and come back and, you know, try whatever. But the, the sound is still there. Mary is an excellent singer as well. And you can, you can play here, man you know for the next 100 years you know <laughs> well you know um washington area the dc area and richmond and were when we first you know we started in jamestown and then it was it was sort of um the next big step was playing in buffalo new york and then um we had some friends <clears throat> who lived in atlanta Georgia, and they said, you know, you should come down to Atlanta and uh, you can get a lot of gigs, live here. So we bought a, a small old 1979 Dodge Tradesman school bus and um, packed all our gear in it and, and moved to Atlanta, rented a house um, in 19, must have been the, the 19, early 1983, I think. And we slept on the floor. We didn't have any furniture and we didn't get many gigs, <clears throat> but we met, you know, we met a few people um, that would help us later on in our career. But the first place we played outside of our hometown, our area was um, Richmond, Virginia, where we had friends there and they booked us a gig. We went and slept in the floors of their apartments and we made more friends there and we, and we went back and played more. And, um, and then we, um, we finally found an agent and he got us in the, in the old 930 club in Washington, DC. And we played there many times. And 
for the longest time, Washington uh, was our most played city. Um, we played there a lot and we played in practically every venue in Washington, D.C. over the 40 years from, you know, the, that small dingy 930 club um, and to um, uh, George, you know, the big, oh, I can't remember, even remember the names of the places, but yeah, eventually Ramshead, played, you play and the, the Bishop Memory Time. And, yeah. Well, and, and, and bigger, you know, bigger venues. We played big auditoriums and we played the, uh, the shed there um, outside of D.C., the uh, outdoor, um, the summer stage thing. So we played there a lot. And I think that's, you know, helped build our audience. And that's why I think we have a lot of success still, you know, playing that area. Mm. I got you, got you. So where you, let's go back to the beginning. Were you born like in a musical family? How old were you when you began, I don't know, taking piano lesson or guitar lesson, whatever, what, what the beginning? Well, I'd say, uh, you know, my parents loved music. They always, they always had music on, uh, big bands, Patsy Cline. Um, uh, you know, my dad liked to sing, you know, when he'd have music on and he played piano a little bit, although we didn't have a piano in our house. Um, when we saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in 64, yeah. I think that's when I first thought, oh, that, that looks like fun. I want to do that. And that was six years old. Um, when and my at the time we were living in my dad was in the air force and we were stationed in uh, Omaha Nebraska he was at SAC headquarters in Omaha and he retired and he retired in 64 right not long after we saw the Beatles and we moved back they moved back home to Jamestown New York and uh, he had um, a guitar that was his father's a 1930 Gibson tenor guitar that he actually used to just hang on the wall of his you know, I guess you'd call it a man cave. It, they had a bar in the basement of the house where they'd entertain friends and stuff. And it was just, you know, it was just a decoration. And when we moved, it, it, it got put in the attic and I was just rooting around up there one day and I saw it, I opened it up and I thought, um, I'm going to learn how to play this. So I bought a, you know, a lesson book and I taught myself how to play guitar chords. And then I'd buy, you know, musical books from, you know, bands I liked when I was sort of a teenager um, and learn those. And the, the kids, the boys across the street from me, um, they played guitar. And uh, so we, our first, first band I was in was, was with those guys. And we played at the nursing home up at the top of our street for the uh, old residents there, or we'd play at the playground for, our, you know, for our friends or on the porch. And we were called Jim and the Jokers because that was Jim was the name of the of the other guy, yeah. and um, mostly sort of old sort of church songs. Michael rode the boat ashore, and uh, you know, old Stewball was a racehorse, and um, uh, and then in um, in the sixth grade, um, the junior high school came to our elementary school. The junior high school band came, and they were recruiting. Um, students kids to take up and pick up an instrument and learn how to play it to play in the junior high band and you invited your parents we went and we saw the performance and um my dad said okay i'll buy you any instrument you want as long as it's not a drum or a violin so i picked trumpet because the conductor played trumpet so i i did that for three years and took lessons and during that time i would take guitar lessons off and on um, and, um, when I got to, uh, high school, I sort of switched to theater because there were, that's where most of the girls were. And I was interested in talking to the girls, you know, I was afraid, but I thought that would give me an opportunity to at least say hello. And so I did some acting and singing and musicals and stuff. Um, uh, and just, I met in, in high school, I met in 1973, I met Dennis Drew he lived on the north side of our town and I grew up on the west side. He was an athlete, you know, and I was in this theater and we became friends over a discussion of, you know, what, who was your favorite band? And his was Bob Dylan and mine was Neil Young. And he said, oh, I play piano. And I said, oh, I play guitar. So I would take the bus across town to his house on weekends and um, with my guitar. 
and we'd sit in his living room and he'd play the piano and we'd do Bob Dylan songs and Neil Young songs and, uh, and kind of dream about being in a band, you wow. know, how fun that would be. Um, and then in, uh, in college at Jamestown Community College, they had a, uh, they were just starting a 10 watt non-commercial FM radio station. And we thought that'd be kind of fun, you know, let's, let's do that. So um, we, we, you know, we were sort of in the ground floor of that. And so we, Dennis was sort of the general manager and I was the m music programmer. And mostly we were just DJs and smoking pot in the parking lot and um, just having fun. And um, that's where we met some of the other members of the band. Uh, one day uh, I was doing a radio shift on a Saturday afternoon or something and a, and a young girl, young woman walks, walks in and says, hey, I, you know, I like your radio station. Would you play some of my records? And I said, sure, come on in. I said, and she said she was going to, she was joining the, uh, the college radio station in the fall or the, the college going to school in the fall. And I said, well, you should, you know, join the club. You know, the radio station was a club. And she said, yeah, okay. So she gave her a DJ shift and, you know, and we just sit around and talk about music. And that was Natalie Merchant. And um, one, and another radio shift, I got a phone call from a guy who worked, worked down the road at a factory and it was Rob Buck, and he, he we started talking about music. He said, "Oh, I love that Gang of Four song you played. I think they're really great." And I said, "Yeah, yeah, I do too." And he said, "Well, I've got this band. We're not really good, and we're sort of this avant-garde punk band, and you know, we're looking for places to play." So we booked him a gig at what we called Wednesday Night Coffee House, and it was just mostly just having fun. There, there, there weren't many students that would come, and we were just having fun. And uh, his band was breaking up and he said, you know, you want to join the band? I said, yeah, I, I play guitar. And he said, well, we need a bass player. And I said, well, that can't be too hard, can it? It's only got four strings. I could figure it out. <clears throat> so we actually, Rob and his, and his friend, they, they held auditions. <clears throat> and I, I went to the audition with a, uh, I brought a bottle of wild turkey with me. I don't know why. And I drank most of it and uh, passed out and he thought, that was just perfect. So I got, I passed the audition and um, we rented a, um, a little 12 by 12 foot room in an abandoned warehouse that these guys had set up this sort of artist cooperative where people would paint and musicians would rehearse and stuff. So um, Dennis played piano. So we invited him down and a friend of ours played drums and he came in and I, I said to Natalie, well, you know, why don't you come and hang out? You know, it's fun. We're just, we smoke pot and play music. And she said, okay. And her mother would come down and drag her home and tell her to stay away from us because we were evil, evil boys. And uh, she just started sort of singing. She would start screaming and singing into the microphone and we, and we weren't very good. So we just wrote our own songs, you know, uh, as best we could. And um, about six weeks later, we got a gig at a bar in Erie, Erie Pennsylvania. And uh, it's a long story and I won't bore everyone with all the details, but we, the, uh, the bar owner threw us out, uh, chased us out the door uh, because of a small altercation. We got paid $50 and um, we just thought that was the coolest thing ever to happen. And so it, from that point on, it was just sort of, we just kept trying, we played in, uh, the local resource center um, where disabled or, and, or ch physically or mentally challenged adults would, you know, have jobs and stuff. And we would, we play in their group homes. Um, you know, we played, um, you know, anywhere we could. Um, and then we, we met John Lombardo, uh, or the rhythm guitarist. He, he was actually the bass player in another band in town and we'd go see them. And, um, we, we became friends and John, like you, he, he had a record collection of about three, 4,000 albums. And he was sort of the, um, you know, the, the go-to guy, if you wanted to know who played, you know, guitar on what record or who produced this record. And cause he had, he just loved it. Like you, he, he listened to music constantly. So he was the elder statesman of music in our town and his band was, sort of breaking up after the summer and we joined together and 
that's when we became 10,000 Maniacs in, in the fall of 1983. We played our first show uh, Labor Day weekend in Jamestown, New York. Yeah, and, and then after, huh? And here we are 40 years later. <laughs> yeah, and then how difficult, I mean, I think the first album was released in 93, uh, Secret of the Aishin. Uh, how difficult was for playing the first gig until trying to get like a record deal with a you know record label? How, how difficult was the first, especially the first year or two, right? So, well, we, um, you, we just thought that was the, the best way forward was writing our own music and yeah. the um <clears throat> the university up the road fredonia state university had a program for tone meisters audio engineers so um, we thought maybe we could record something there so we put a poster up in the student union in the common room and said you know we're an original band uh or a band that writes original music and if, and one of the students called and we, we became their senior project for their um for their thesis you know to get their uh, uh master's degree for audio engineering or maybe it was bachelor's degree and um we had to record mid from midnight till eight o'clock in the morning because that's the only time was available and uh i you know we recorded in a hurry um uh, we didn't have much time, you know, because it was the end of the school year. It was actually Human Conflict number five was the first uh, record we, we recorded, uh, five songs. <clears throat> and then uh, the next year we did the same thing with, and we recorded Secrets of the I Ching. And so what we did was we, we borrowed money from our parents and our friends, um, uh, kind of like the early versions of, of, uh, of, of, um, crowdsourcing to you know yeah. to pay for it and um we sent looking in in records and in magazines you know rolling stone and musician magazine we just look for influential names and find addresses and we sent those people records and one of them was uh john peel who was the the great uh dj of bbc one in london um, and he, he just played the coolest music, although we didn't know, except, you know, this was 83, there was no internet, you know, there were no cell phones. It was um, kind of like the Stone Ages, if you think about it. Um, but we sent him Secret to the I Ching, and he played the song My Mother of the War on his radio show. And he wrote us, he wrote us a letter. Uh, and uh, and said that he how, how much he liked the song and that he got it got good response from his listeners and in 1983 the year-end poll from his listeners we out of he called it his nifty 50 his 50 favorite artists of that year we were 23 wow so um that was sort of an opening for us and in we found an agent. The agent got us into uh, um, better clubs in, in bigger cities in New York. And in I think in March of um, 84, we met, um, uh, we met a couple of Englishmen who were at, at our gig at Danceteria. One was a um, uh, artist uh, a and r representative for a record company and the other was a uh, gentleman who managed bands and um the the manager guy said you know howard thompson was here he's he, i think he liked you guys you should contact him here's his number and um so we contacted howard and he said yeah you know let me think about it so Peter Leake, the other Englishman, who he became our manager, and he had this idea. He said, all right, we're going to go play in London. We're going to get you three gigs, um, and it's going to get you some press. And we played in Brixton at the Fridge. We played in at Dingwalls in um, Camden Town, and we played at the famous Marquee Club in London. And it did. It got us press. The British press wrote about it because they were very good about, you know, covering music in the British press. They just loved it, right? And, and of course, Britain had a national radio station. They had the BBC, unlike America, where it's just so big, you know, it's, there wasn't really a national radio station until MTV came along. But 
because of those gigs and the press that we got, it, um, you know, we got some more attention from other people. And uh, Howard Thompson signed us to Elektra Records in uh, the fall of 1984. And then he said, you got two months to write 20 more songs because we got to go record uh, in February. So, <laughs> wow. oh, oh no. no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, oh, yeah, no pressure. Um, so we did that. We went and we actually went to London to record the record with Joe Boyd, who worked with early Pink Floyd. Joe produced early stuff um, um, with them. He did some Fairport Convention because we were sort of fans of that music. Uh, and he was a great guy. He helped us a lot. And that's where he recorded um, the Wishing Chair in London. We lived there for five or six months. It was glorious. We had it was just great. So much fun. You know, we got turned on to curry, you know, and so we ate it constantly. <laughs> it was it was great fun. Yeah, I, I love going to London. It's, uh, it's very expensive, but it's a great, yeah. it's a great city, man. It's crazy to live there, man. It's so pricey. But yeah, so many great we, have, we haven't been there in a while and we really want to get back. And of course, I think when, you know, when we were there, it wasn't nearly as expensive. And of course, you know, all our stuff was paid for, so <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> Good for you, man. So what about, then a couple of years after you guys did uh, In My Tribe, right? So that's what you got. I think uh, one hit went to, <clears throat> I mean, the album went to number 37. So that was a big, big deal, right? I mean, you were getting noticed um, here, at least in Europe and here in the United States as well, right? So Yeah. Um, the, the wishing chair, the, the record company didn't recoup their money for that, but we, we didn't spend a lot on it. And, and back then, um, you know, record companies were still interested in developing acts they, and they, they would give bands a second chance and they did with us. But they said, you know, we've got, you've got to use, a, a, you know, a bigger name producer. And so they picked Peter Asher and uh, Peter wanted to record out in Los Angeles. So, so we went out there in uh, 86 and, um, or 87, I, I forget which, what year or anything is. And uh, Peter taught us a lot. Uh, he taught us really about playing in tune and in time and um, getting hooks and songs. And one day we were in the studio uh, just goofing around while they were fixing something. And Rob Buck started playing the riff to Cat Stevens' Peace Train. Yeah. So we all just jumped in and we were just, just goofing around. You know, and Natalie started singing, right on the Peace Train. Peter Asher ran in the room and said, what's that, what's that? And we said, uh, it's Peace Train by Cat Stevens. He said, oh, play it again. So we played it again. He said, okay, we're gonna record that. And we weren't particularly happy about that because you know, we wanted to record our stuff. Our own stuff, he yeah. said, no, no. He said, well, you know, we gotta we got do this, we gotta do this. So. So we recorded it and Peter made it his, you know, his, his personal uh, 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 mission to make that song a hit. And it, it started getting us radio airplay um, and more attention. And the record, got, you know, we always got very good um, reviews and in, in music reviews and magazines. The press and the writers really liked us a lot um, for the most part. <clears throat> Because we were unique, you know, we didn't sound like anybody else. Um, and then the um, the success of that of that radio play helped get us on late night television. Um, our first uh, was actually it was the Johnny Carson show back then, and on Friday nights Jay Leno would be the host, and that's when they'd have pop music, you know. Uh, so we got that. And that, that got us on David Letterman. And then that eventually got us on more radio stations and, and eventually on Saturday, Saturday Night Live. And then, you know, that crazy thing called MTV happened. And, you know, that played a big role for us too. Yeah, man, good for you. So you were making, at the time, making enough money to, I suppose, to, well, more than enough to survive in music and, uh, and, and kind of the rest of history, right? So. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were, you know, we could, we could afford a nicer used car. Um, 
I got married in 87 and my wife and I, um, you know, we, I was making enough money. So we bought a little, you know, a little house out in the, out in the country, Yeah. you know, and then, you know, and then the family started coming along. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and the next up was uh, Blind Man Sue, right? Yeah. That, Blind that, Man that Sue. received a lot of success in, in charting, not just in the U.S., but in the U.K., in in, um, yeah, we, 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 did, we did that one again with Peter Asher because we enjoyed working with him and he enjoyed working with us. Uh, but we kind of talked him into coming east and we went to Woodstock, New York, and we recorded that record there. Um, it didn't sell as many records as um, um, ultimately as, as um, In My Tribe did. It, it didn't have, you know, the really big radio hits, but, you know, we, we were... MTV, you know, we said, okay, we'll do videos. And, but we, the boys, we kind of pushed Natalie to, to be the star of that stuff. We said, you do it. We, we don't need to be in the video. You do it. And so she did. And, um, you know, it certainly helped her career later on, uh, being the face of the band and the voice. Mm -hmm. Um, although the, although the boys in the band wrote most of the music, you know, some, some of the songs she wrote the music too, but most of them were, uh, written by uh, the right, boys so in the band. Yeah. Um, yeah, MTV was the national radio station, you know, it was such a big thing and it, we just, we were in the right place at the right time, you know, when that came out and the record company, you know, would f find the budget, the money to, you know, to make it. Of course, they, record companies were rolling in dough back then because of that thing called CDs and everyone in, you know, everyone went out and bought their record collection all over again in CDs because they were so convenient. And, you know, it, there's an argument whether or not they sound <clears> better or not. That, that sort of depends on the individual, I think, but they were just rolling in cash. Uh, so th they were spending it everywhere, you know, and I'm sure we've probably spent too much money making some of our records. We could have done them less expensively, but, um, you know, we were selling millions of records, you know, and then, so then we got into bigger venues and, you know, how that goes. <laughs> yeah. In, 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 if it's not a, a very intrusive question, in general term, what, why was the reason, if you could tell me, if no, it's okay, what Natalie Merchant ended up leaving? I mean, she was like the faith, uh, attractive lady, she was doing the video, and then, like in many bands, I support our discussion or, and she say, or whatever it was, hey, I can sing very well without you guys. I want to move my own. And it's, it, you know. Well, I, I think she, she got that from um, a, a lot of people. Like, you don't need these guys, you know. Um, uh, you know, and she had no ambition to be um, in music. When we met her, she was going to college to be, to go into humanities or be a social worker. You know, she did not have ambitions to be a singer in a band. She, we all, you know, the boys in the band, we wanted to be in a band since we probably all saw the Beatles. You know? Right, yeah. Um, and she was too young to see that. You know, she was, she was considerably younger than we are. Still is. <laughs> um, and she, you know, we were also boys. And sometimes, you know, we do boyish things and uh you know we like to drink and we like to smoke pot and you know we did other drugs and she really didn't she didn't like that or appreciate that from us and um she often told us she was going to leave the band you know and then finally and before we recorded um our time in eden she said we sat down and she said boys <laughs> this is the last studio record i'm doing with you and we were okay with that, you know, we couldn't stop her. We were glad that, you know, we had the opportunity to do one more record with her. Um, and, I, you know, I'll tell you, Claudio, that was making that um, record was probably, it, it was really fun. It was really relaxing. We enjoyed working with our producer, Paul Fox. He's a great guy. And um, it, 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 was, it was a really great time. But she, you know, Natalie wanted to control her music. She, she did not like 
art by committee. She didn't like the way sometimes we, we would take her songs and develop, in, develop them into our style of playing. And, you know, I think she also wanted to, you know, control all her record royalties, you yeah. know, and not, and, you know, so everything was hers. Yeah. So, you know, we can't blame her for it. It's, yeah. We, you know, we, were, yeah. we, were for, we were fortunate that we got to do the, the second MTV unplugged thing because that, that became a, you know, very successful record as well. So, yeah, so, yeah. And, and that's, you know, it, it helped us get along for a while. Yeah, yeah, Sometimes it's always, I mean, when you leave a band, right, <clears throat> you're, you're always taking the risk, right? So you might go on your own and then hire, you know, when a good, you know, because based on your experience uh, with a new record label and hire a bunch of guys to, um, to do new things. And sometimes it works out for singers, sometimes it doesn't, right? So everybody need to do what, <clears throat> what they need to do, I suppose. And it happened to many bands, right? With, I don't know, like Peter Gabriel leaving Genesis and Gumbo and other band complain, well, if we are six in the band, we need to split the sale into six, right? It goes, That's you know, right. Split. Yeah. And some members are, no, 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 no. I, I want to take three thirds of that because I wrote that and I'm a good looking person and people know me. And, TV for my fame, whatever, whatever. The well, yes, there is that involved. Um, I, it, I think it happens a lot. Uh, and then she did very well her life. I'm, I'm happy for her. I never have the opportunity to uh, meet her or, well, I have seen her many times. But, and then so, then John and, and Mary came along. Right? You, you, you guys needed to find, a, you know, a, a new singer, I suppose. And, uh, and uh, how, yeah, you, well, how you get a hold of Mary? How you have that? You know, came well, out. that was that was really uh, John when he he left yeah. the band. You know, we had sort of a difference of opinion of musical direction, and yeah. uh, there were some arguments and bad feelings when he left. Unfortunately, because um, uh, he left right before we recorded in my tribe, and that's when we started making money. Yeah. And, and he likes to say it was, he, f he felt like it was, he broke up with his girlfriend and then she won the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> but so when John left, he, I think he, he moved to Buffalo, New York from Jamestown where, where he lived. And um, uh, John is, uh, you know, he's a single man. He's, he's been single his whole life. He likes to go out and see bands. He listens to music all the time. Um, he's like you, he goes to a lot of shows and he saw Mary playing in a string quartet, I think. And they just started talking about music and, you know, what music they liked. And, uh, and John said, you know, could you maybe play, I've got this song, could you play viola on it or sing on it? So that's when they formed their duo, John and Mary. Yeah. And they actually, they got, a, they got a record contract with Ryko Disc and uh, they made three CDs and, um, Actually, in 1991, after um, Blind Man Zoo was out, we needed to take some time off. We were all getting very tired and needed some time at home. Uh, and the record company said, well, you got to put something out. So they took the masters from our first two independent records, Human Conflict Number no. 5 and, and Secrets of the I Ching, and they remastered them, remixed them. Uh, and then re-release them as uh, the album, The Hope, Hope Chest. And um, when we toured, so John was back working with us. He and Natalie did most, they, they, they worked on the artwork and, and they did, they went in the studio with the producer and worked on the remixes and things like that. So um, uh, 90, 91, 92, we went out on a, for a small tour, Hope Chest tour, we called it. And we invited John and Mary with us. So the, they were our opening act. And then John would join us on stage when we played all those songs from his era when he was with the band. And Mary would sing back up for Natalie and play viola on songs. Um, and we, we got along really well. And when we recorded um, um, 
our time in Eden, Mary came in and did some vocals and played some string parts and songs. I think the song Jezebel, she played strings on. And then uh, we invited Mary to be with us when we did the MTV Unplugged. She was, she was in that show. She sang back up vocals and played viola. And actually, if you look closely on the cover of the MTV Unplugged, the picture of Natalie, right over Natalie's left shoulder, you can see Mary Ramsey there. Really? Wow, I need yeah, to check. Yeah, and that was totally unintentional. Uh, um, so after Natalie left, um, you know, I, my, my son was born, you know, like a month after Natalie left the band. So I was very content to in, not go anywhere. Um, uh, I bought some land, I built a house, you know, a nest for my new family. And uh, we ran into John in Jamestown over uh, the Christmas holidays in, and I think 94. And he said, yeah, Mary and I have a bunch of songs, you know, why don't we go up and record them? And we had been, Rob and Dennis and I had been, you know, doing a little bit of writing in, in, our, in our studio here at town. So we went up to Buffalo to a studio and did some demos for some songs and uh, got along really well and liked how it sounded. Um, so because we got, we got the name of the band 10,000 Maniacs in the divorce from Natalie. She let us keep the name. <laughs> really? Wow. Well, she, she, you know, she really didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. And it, it really wasn't an issue, but we thought, you know, which it's, it's most of the band. Let's keep the name. Sure. You know, who cares what people think? Um, so um, our the first tour we did with that band, it was actually called John and Mary, Rob, Dennis, Steve, and Jerry. We, we did about a, three week tour in the Northeast, trying out the new material, you know, playing in small bars and stuff. And uh, we were recording, we were writing songs for um, what would eventually become the Earth Press Flat uh, in nine, oops, excuse me, in 90, uh, 96, I think, or something like that. And uh, somehow Geffen Records, uh, heard about what we were doing and one of their representatives came to Jamestown and we had a we had a meeting and went out to dinner and he signed us to Geffen Records and um, uh, so we sort of stopped what we were doing and they said well you got to write you know a bunch of new material again so we did that and that was a record that would eventually become um, Love Among the Ruins that was released on Geffen Records in 97 and that had this this single um, more than this the Roxy Music song. We got you. Man, that's a great story. So after that, so after that period, um, you know, you began, you know, with your family and your wife, and you were not doing that much. Uh, what was at the time? You were younger, of course. And then what was the motivation to to keep on keep on going on the road? I mean, besides the money, everybody to make money, and as touring musician, need to go out to make some money. But what was the motivation to keep keep the the, the the band together and writing the song and stuff like that it's what we wanted to do i didn't want to go get another job or as we like to say get a real job a real job um, <laughs> yeah you know uh it, it's what we've always wanted to do and we thought you know here's another opportunity let's not let it slip by and, yeah. um, and, you know, and we just, we found that we still loved each other, even though, you know, past arguments, you know, we buried the hatchet and, and, um, and, you know, just kept going, you know, it's, the pause. you know, you, you got to get that, you know, um, it's, it's the drug that we love. And, um, and we were, you know, we were fortunate to have the opportunity with Geffen Records, um, you know, and of course, then right at that time, the, the, the record industry completely fell apart because while, the, while they had their hands in the cookie jar taking money out because of all the CDs people bought, what they didn't know was they were shareable files. They were digital files. And all of a sudden, Napster comes along and says, oh, we can share these songs. You don't have to buy them. And the, rec and the industry started falling apart. And Geffen Records had to start dumping uh, bands from their roster. And we were probably the last one signed and the first one to go. They said, sorry, you know, they released the one single and that was it. We were getting ready to release 
hopefully rainy day for our second single. Um, but they said, nah, you know, you're out. So, <laughs> wow, now what do we do? So we just kept going, you know, we were working now with our friend and producer, Armand Petrie, Armand Petrie, and he, um, he recorded stuff with us then with John and Mary and, um, you know, so, and he works, he works very inexpensively. He just likes doing it. He just likes us. Um, so we were lucky that we had that. And we released the Earth, the Earth Press flat. Didn't sell many copies, um, mm. but you know we st we could still make a little bit of money on the road. You know it was tough, and then uh, you know and then Rob died, and that was sad. <laughs> that, yeah, that, was, it, that was a knife to the heart. Yeah, so it's tough to be. Uh... In general, I say, you know, be a musician, be on the road. I mean, I, I go to a venue, I pay a hundred bucks, whatever, I drink a couple of beers and I eat something, I go home and I, but I don't think about it, how the band got there, they, the people slept the night before, they were on a tour bus for five hours the night before, they arrive at whatever, three o'clock in the morning, they need to go to a hotel, catch sleep, and they play the venue and they do the same thing again the day after. It's, 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 plus it's not as, hanging it's out not with as the glamorous. same people. Huh? Yeah. It's not as glamorous as people think. Yeah, <laughs> it's really so. hard. <laughs> Kinking out with the same people, you know. If you got yeah. another boy with Johnny, Peter, and Mary the night before, you need to see them in the morning. What the heck, man? It's it's a lot of work. It's very tough, man. Yeah, and it, and if you can't get along, um, mm. it's it's really it's just not a good environment to be in. Um, mm. But we we were lucky enough that you know we enjoy each other's company, and. Uh, uh, and that's kind of why we tour the way we do now. I think if we were going to go and do a four month tour, that would be the end of the band. Because if we were with each other that all that time, you know, I don't Wouldn't think work. it would yeah. work. So, you know, we, we're, we try to keep the long view here um, and, and, and stretch it out and only go out for long weekends and maybe Maybe if we go to South America, we might be gone for a couple of weeks. Or if we go to the West Coast of the U.S., we might, you know, play from San Diego up to S Seattle, depending on, you know, if the agent can find the right um, gigs and stuff for us. But we, we, like to, we like to get away from each other, go home, be with our families, um, and sort of forget about it for a while. So it's not such an obsession you know, because it becomes, it's, you really get obsessed with it when you're making a record, uh, you know, when you're on the road and it, it really, it's all consuming. It's, it's all you can think about. Um, and this way, the way we do it now, you know, we can get a break from it and have a little time out and, um, and go and, you know, go play some golf and, you know, and work in the garden and, uh, it, it's it's healthier, I think, for our you know, f uh, for our minds and for our f relationships. Absolutely, man. And uh, have you ever? You mentioned South America. Have you ever been? Have you ever played there? Oh yeah, we've been to Brazil, um, Brazil right? oh, five man. times. Yeah, yeah. We 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 found a we found a really good promoter down there, um, and he's had us there five times. We've played in Buenos Aires once. Yeah. Uh, we've played in Mexico City and yeah. uh, Guadal Guadalajara, yeah. um, Panama. Um, I think that's it. You know, we'd, we'd love to go back. South America is great. Yeah. And we we're talking before we begin recording, you know, if you go to Spotify, uh, Brazil and, and Chile, so there, there's where you have more listeners to, you know, music we, yeah, Spotify. Right? We so do. And, and we're, you know, I think we probably would have been back in Brazil um, again sooner, um, but, you know, because of the pandemic. And I think maybe the state of the politics in Brazil is kind of struggle. The economy is struggling, but our, the promoter down there has said he wants to bring us back um, maybe in 2023. And um, we'd certainly like to get the opportunity to go, uh, you know, to play in Chile and um argentina again you know we love we love buenos aires we were we were in a little soho is where we were staying it's a beautiful part of the city yeah, um, yeah. 
it was the the gigs that they had for us were very strange. The venues were were too big. They were sort of arenas and it just it was too big we didn't draw enough people so it was it was kind of it just didn't feel right but the and the promoter lost he uh, you know he lost a lot of money i think but he he really likes the band and uh, he'll you know he'll have us back yeah are you going nowadays are you sell i mean the, with the material that you you're putting out or They have, but are you doing self-releases or you go to an independent record label? Because every time I go to Beachmer, you end up, you know, like a on the shelf, they have some CD, T-shirt and stuff like that. You guys doing your own or? Yeah, we've been doing, um, we've recorded uh, music from the motion picture, um, playing favorites, which is a sort of, is a live record that we did recorded here in, in Jamestown. Um, and then we, we released a record called um, um, Twice Told Tales, which was basically um, covers of some of our favorite uh, traditional folk songs. Yeah. Um, and then we recorded an, another album in uh, San Diego or in um, Solana Beach, California at a really cool venue called Belly Up. Um, they have in-house recording. So we just said, okay, let's try it. And, you know, funny enough, we do get royalties from those, from like that belly up record. Uh, it's not much, it's, you know, $700 a year, but you know, it's, it's, yes. it's working. And, um, you know, the, another great thing that happened be, because of the, uh, uh, the internet was um, crowdsourcing, yeah. was being able to raise money um, with fan support. And we actually, we were in a, a crowdfunding um, platform called, um, uh, I forget, <laughs> uh, I'll remember it. Um, and so we, we, we tried that and we did raise enough money to make um, uh, uh, a couple of those records just from the kindness of our fans, you know? And they, you know, you, you'd, you'd, you'd pledge, oh, pledge music, that's what it was, you'd pledge you know, $50. And when the record was done, you'd get a, uh, you know, vinyl a CD and a t-shirt and maybe your name listed on the record as a executive producer. Um, so, uh, that helped us. And you guys planning to do that again so I can, I can contribute or. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. um, pledge music, unfortunately, I don't know what happened to them, but that fell apart. I mean, there's things like Kickstarter, Yeah, keeps I don't, you know, the, they're a lot of work um, because you have to keep your fans engaged while you're doing it. So over a period of maybe six months while you're, or five months, whatever, while you're making the record, you need to put, um, you need to put stuff out there. You need to have videos so they can sort of see you recording, you know, because I think a lot of people, a lot of fans are really fascinated about the actual art The process, the making, you know, yeah. yeah, the making of the music, the process, and while it's can be very, <laughs> very boring, um, uh, because you sit around a lot, um, uh, it, you know, it is, it, it's you know, you know, fans don't get to see that, so, um, so we did that with, um, with a couple of records, but and actually, I did that because I'm the, the most computer literate, and I was the first person to have a computer, the first person to have a laptop, the first person to have a smartphone. Wow. Um, you like you know, technology? The first, the first person, yeah, to have a Facebook page and social media. And yeah, I like it. I got my, I bought my first Apple computer in 1987. Good for you, man. Yeah. What I should have done was bought Apple stock. <laughs> I just kept buying their product. <laughs> yeah, the stock is doing very well. Well, You know, nowadays the market's <laughs> kind of iffy, but um, yeah. But uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm glad you like technology. But that's what I do for a living. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and you know, but, uh, look, looking back, uh, looking back at your musical career, uh, what moments are special to you? If you will any any regret or thing you will have done differently? Looking, back, everybody can look back and say, "Man, I should have done that and that and that." And some people say, "No, no, no. You know, my, I'm happy with my life or whatever." Well, I think one of the most exciting moments for us was when we first time we landed in London. Yeah. 
that was uh, that was very ex just thrilling. And that's when we went just to play those three shows. We landed in Heathrow and we were driving to our hotel through the city streets and, you know, having never been there, it was just, it was just so cool um, to be in another country and uh, um, taste the food and hold the coins in your hand and, you know, uh, talk to people. Um, uh, that was pretty neat. I think um, we did a, a, a USO show, uh, four shows in the Middle East in 1999. Uh, we played in uh, Kuwait City, Bahrain, and, uh, and then we played a concert for American troops out in the desert uh, by the Iraqi border. Um, that was an amazing experience. Um, being there, you know, being in those countries. Um, regrets, I think, um, I think I, w I wish I would have paid more attention to what we were doing. Uh, I was just sort of along for the ride, having fun, you know, you know, we worked, worked hard at it, but just sometimes it was just more like, yeah, I'm just, this is fun. I wish I would have paid more attention in the studios. Um, I mean, although we, I learned a lot, but um, I could have learned more. Um, uh, you know, I, I think maybe I, I, looking back, I wish I would have rehearsed more, you know, on my own time. Uh, but we were always, we were playing so much, you know, we were either in the studio or in our rehearsal space, writing songs, or we were on the road. You know, when I got home, what, what I wanted to do was just decompress and sort of forget about it. Yeah. Because um, yeah. I'd, I'd be a better player, you know, and I'm still getting better. We've been playing a lot lately and uh, my playing has improved quite a bit. I'm really quite happy about that. And uh, um, See, also the, the finance, you, you haven't mentioned the financial aspect or the promotion of the marketing. That's important, you know, bands, when I play great music, by they will sell you from t-shirt to toilet paper with the face and whatever, yeah. or royalty, yeah. better deals. And it's gotta be always, a, I don't know, I'm a, a financial person or in the band that can say, hey guys, if we do that, we can make more money and that will pay off 20 years from now, 30 years from now, so we can retire on it, right? I suppose some people say, no, 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 50 bucks is good enough for now. And let's drink a couple of beer and we'll go to the next town. and. You know, that, that's exactly right. And that's why um, you, you've got to be lucky and get a good manager. And, and we did. We had a very good manager. He always looked out for us. And even though he's not officially our manager still, he still looks out for us. And, uh, you know, we're looking for, um, you know, there's a law that 35 years after the release of a record, so for those 35 years, the record companies own the masters, Ooh. you know, the original recordings. But after 35 years, the bands have the rights to take yeah. those masters back and do whatever they want with them. Yeah. So the wishing chair turned 35 two years ago or last year. Um, In my tribe is 35 years next year. So we're gonna own those masters. Now we have, Natalie has to agree because, because of what our partnership was, de was designed that um, we, you know, we need to, uh, everyone needs to agree on what we're gonna do with it. So we're, at the moment, we're looking to get uh, a higher rate on streams, um, uh, a s thing called sync licenses that where your, your music goes into, um, commercials and movies and TV and things like that, you can get a better rate. So we're actually in the process of negotiating with Warner Brothers, Warner Music Group um, now, trying to get a better rate or s s tell them, well, we're gonna take our records and you know go somewhere else right. and yeah. try to force their hand. So we're, we're sort of right in the middle of that, you know, right now um, <clears throat> and for, you know, we always, for the longest time, we held on to our publishing rights too. We, we 
pre preferred then just to let the, the, the money from publishing come in slowly, you know, every year instead of taking a big lump sum of money and then not having that income for five years or 10 years, depending on what the, what the publishing deal was. Um, so we always had good advice. And I think our, our record company, Electra, I think for the most part, they were a really good company to be with for us. Um, I liked a lot of the people that worked there. I think they really liked us and they enjoyed working for us because we weren't, you know, we were, we were nice people, you know, we didn't complain too much, you know, we, we didn't demand things. Um, we sort of trusted their advice. Um, and I, for, I think for the most part, we always got good advice. So, you know, um, I'm very happy where I am today and what we're doing and, you know, how we're playing and yeah. the music we, music we're making. And the, the other thing for me, you know, I, I'm always want to talk to the people, take some picture with them, have autographs, CD, because I have a huge collection. And you guys do that. At least in the Bishmer, after the show is over, you go to the bar, you drink a cup of beer, people approach, you take some picture. You're very approachable. People like this stuff. Other you know, with the COVID, it was you know kind of a little bit difficult because people didn't want to get exposed. But other bands, they don't care. They don't want to take a picture. They don't want to sign an autograph. They go in the back door and they go to the hotel and you know. Yeah, so, yeah. They leave. And they leave. You know. Um, I like doing that. You know, and I think Mary is very shy. She's not. Yeah, she, she doesn't is, really she like. Is. She doesn't like doing that. And our and our drummer Jerome, he's very shy too. He doesn't like to. He doesn't like the back slapping and the handshaking and the photographs, you know, things. But um, you know, Dennis and Jeff and John and I, we we enjoy it. You know, always. I mean, I, I I like meeting you, and I like our our fans are they're fun, and we we become friends. And a lot of them are coming to Jamestown in May to see our homecoming show here in Jamestown. They're flying in from all over, and yeah. and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually take them on. The morning of the concert, I'm going to take them on a little walkabout around downtown Jamestown and show them all the buildings that oh. we had rehearsal spaces in or bars that we played in. And we're just going to walk around and I'm tell some stories and, you know, we'll have a cup of coffee and um, yeah. have a few laughs, you know. I That's like true. that. I'm just Yeah. Like, and plus, at the same time, for a, a financial point of view, people will go back to the store and buy t-shirts, buy CDs and you yes. get pictures. So you can make a little bit of money. So... It's like a, it's like a business, you know, relationship. Well, oh yes, thank you. Picture. You know, so. it, well, exactly, um, and that's another but reason. Why I know that. It. I noticed that Mary uh, is never coming out. And I, I think uh, somebody told me that a, a, a couple of times people confuse her. They call her Natalie or something, and she got pissed off. I don't know if it's true or not, but you know. But of course, we need to. Well, so. yes, we we do. <laughs> we we still do get that. Um, Five years ago, we were playing at a bar in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And after the show, a woman came up to me. She was a little intoxicated, but she said, she said to me, she said, I didn't know Natalie played the violin. And I said, she doesn't. She said, yes, she does. I said, no, I don't no. think she does. And she said, well, yeah, she was just playing it. I said, no, that's Mary Ramsey. And she said, it was not. I said, yes, that's Mary Ramsey. She said, it's Natalie. And I said, okay. That's Natalie. See you later. I could I could not convince her. Of course. And during the show, I say to the audience, "Oh, look who's back, Mary Ramsey." You know, uh, and it says, you know, just for I think casual fans who use music as a background and don't really aren't as passionate about it as you are or John Lombardo who yeah. read the line, who read the liner notes, you know, and see who produced it and where it was made. And, you know, you like that, right? It's, it's important to, to music fans like you to know the information and to the casual fan, they don't, they're not paying attention. So they just see the name you know, oh, 10,000 maniacs. And we get it on social media all the time. 10,000 maniacs. Well, you're only nine, you know, you're only 900, 9,999 because Natalie's gone or, you know, no Natalie, no thanks. Or, you know, really? we get a lot of, yeah, we get a lot of distractors like that in, in Facebook posts all the time. And um, 
I, tr you know, because I do a lot of the social media and I, I'm the administrator of our Facebook page. And um, so I, I try to answer every question mm -hmm. and I, and I try to inject some humor into it and, um, uh, and not get angry, but, you know, we wouldn't be where we are without Natalie Merchant, but she wouldn't be where she is without you us know. yeah absolutely right yeah. you know um we you know we were part of it you know we wrote a lot of the music you know the music to these are days the music was written by rob buck um and and i sometimes i can't convince people that and i said well go read the record jacket it says right there uh, um so it, it can be frustrating um uh but you know it's it's just it is that's what it is you know, 40 years later, you guys, you know, 40th anniversary and still playing and kicking around and traveling and uh, enjoying the music, enjoying your life. It's pretty good, man. It couldn't be that bad, right? If if 40 years after that, people still, guys like myself and thousands of other people go and, and see you guys. I mean, the quality is there, the music is there, it's different. Some people have come, come and go and but still, for the most part, the same band, you know? I, well, we did, I liked we did two. I liked yeah. Well, we did two really important things, I think, that made us um, better musicians, which would make us a better band. And one was we quit drinking before our shows. So when we're on stage, we're all sober. Really? It took us a, it took us a long time to, to get to that point. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, really good. It, we became a lot better. And then the second thing we did was we invested quite a bit of money in in-ear monitors. Um, so one to try to save what hearing we have left because uh, i i suffer from terrible tinnitus my ears ring constantly i can hear them right now it's loud and it's sometimes depressing it's always annoying um but you know i, I got a happy life that's just a mild annoyance but so we wanted to protect our hearing and then it also, um, when we play now, because of the, the you know, the inner monitors that we use, we can really hear each other. When you're on stage with amp, because we don't even have, you know, we don't have onstage amplifiers anymore. We don't use guitar amps or bass amps. It's, it's all direct right into the board, right to the front of the house. Um, so it's quiet on stage. All you're hearing is the drums. You know, if you're if you're sitting at the Birchmere and you're in that front row and you're underneath the PA, yeah, you hear a lot of drums and yeah. nothing else. Um, so it it gave us the opportunity to really hear what each one of us was doing and to be musically together. You know, on stage with the wedges and the amplifiers, it's just loud. It's, it's really hard to to really hear things well. And not only are you doing damage to your ears, you know, at this, if a stage decibel level is at, you know, 106 or 110 decibels, I mean, you're damaging your ears. And um, we've, I, I've spent a lot of time learning about that and talking to my audiologist and understanding what's going on. And um, so I could hear everything Jeff was playing, you know, on the other side of the stage. It sounds like he's right in my head, you know? And then the other part of that is, oh my God, they can all hear what I'm playing. I better be damn good. That's right. <laughs> so it, it made us, it really made us strive to be better because, because of this new environment of being able to hear ourselves yeah. and playing sober. <laughs> Well, you drink after, Jeff, you go to the bar. Well, that's that's the reward for us, you know. That's when, right, when you know, you over. earn it, you know. You, you gotta yeah. earn yeah. drinks, you know, beer. Earn it, that's right. Yeah, you, you, what, do you, what do you prefer, Chilean, do you like wine or, or you beer type of guy, or both? Um, I like wine that tastes like vodka. <laughs> what is that? I don't know. I'm I from Chile, vodka. so I'm, uh, Chile is well no, known no. for, for uh, wine, so I will, I will For great wine, yeah, I, I like a, wine. A, a couple um, of bottles of good stuff. Um, see, you, I, see you next time. Uh, absolutely, I'd, I'd love to try it. Um, no, I like wine, but um, I'm I like um, I'm a sort of I like vodka or scotch. Yeah, I like you know vodka and soda or scotch and soda. In in the winter, I drink scotch and soda. In the summer, I drink vodka and sodas. 
<laughs> or, 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 you know, I, I like a Caparena. I make those at home. They're good. Do you know what uh, in Chile they drink and, and in Peru too? Pisco sour. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever no, tried that? What, what's it called? Uh, uh, pisco, P-I-S-C-O, and then sour, sour. S-O-U-R. No, yep. you cannot find the stuff. It's probably like a Caparena, right? Because it's, that's... It's, it's very, a, I mean, for people, I, I, I'm a beer table guy, so for people that like vodka and whiskey, they, they like the kind of stuff. I, I'm a, I did, I, when I was living in Chile, I didn't drink much. And when I came to the United States to study, I began hanging out with American kids. So we were, you know, drinking beer, <laughs> eating pizza and chasing girls when it was cool, you know. But, of but that's another story. That's what you do. <laughs> that's what you do, you know. That's, that's, that's all you can afford. <laughs> that's what you are poor, you know. I, was, I did yeah. okay. And then I went to graduate school. I did okay. So i very, very fortunate that I was able to survive this country. And I became a U.S. citizen. I have all my life here. So I, looking back with... Uh, you know, that was the best decision for me. It's, uh, people don't know how good they have it here in the United States, you know. I'm, uh, yeah. Very proud to be a youth citizen. And people complain too much. Man. That's what I said. Well, that's, you know, it's easy to complain. You know. You know, it's easy to complain about something because you don't have to do anything but open your mouth and you know, let buy. Whether well, you like this oil. press, you know, that press, you know, this or yeah. that. But still, you know, get a job, go to school, whatever. Well, yeah. uh, I'm I'm an average guy who was able to make it. I'm I'm I'm, I'm the American dream alive, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, America's yeah. better for it because you're here. Well, you know, well, the the former president didn't believe that, and he was kicking out all the immigrants and uh, kind of crazy, you know. And uh, hopefully, you know, the war on Ukraine will be over. That's very. Uh, I saw this stuff and Putin and. And we, we live in crazy world. Why people cannot live in peace? It's, it's, it's crazy, you know. It's, uh, I think um, well, one of our biggest enemies in, in the world is greed. Yeah. People, are gr people are greedy. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and greed now is very popular. You know, there are more billionaires in the world now than I mean, I don't know, you can't even count how many there are. And, and I, I've got nothing against someone making a billion dollars, but who needs that much money? You can't yeah. spend it. That's right, yeah. You know, it's like they're hoarding, they're hoarders. They hoard money. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, instead of hoarding books or, you know, or magazines, they hoard money. And, yeah. you know, good, you know, fine, but... There, there are people who, not of their own fault, are starving. Mm. You know, this war is really going to make, starvation is going to be a real problem coming up. The, you know, supply chains being broken and, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to be all right. Um, but there's a, a lot of people in the world who aren't and they're going to start. Um, you know, United States and other European countries are putting a lot of economic pressure on Russia and People in Russia, the common and the average Joe that had nothing to do with the world, whether they like or not, put it, yeah. it's going to be starving as it is right now. The economy in in in, in, uh, in Russia has collapsed, and there are, you know, these crazy guys running the country, and they're all killing their own Russian people in Ukraine, and you know, Ukraine have nothing to do with that, and it's, it's a mess. I will, you know, yeah. it's crazy. It's man. very sad. It's very sad. Hey, my friend, it was very nice talking to you, man. And uh, we'll get you some Chilean wine. I will see you at the, at the Bishmer in a couple of weeks. And Do you have we'll, tickets we'll talk yet? some more, man. I'll put you on the guest list. Huh? I'll put you on the guest list. Thank you very much, man. Yeah. And I need to get a, a CD. Well, I have uh, several CDs signed by me, but I, we, I need to talk to Mary to sign the stuff because it's important to me. I, I want to, I, you know, some people download the stuff and uh, download PDF. No, for me, I like the real thing. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. I buy vinyl because I'm, I'm helping the band. I buy CDs. I buy T-shirts. I want to get an autograph CD by everybody because I want to contribute to the band as well to make a little bit of money. And, you know, so. Well, I need to, but, and Mary never, you know, comes in to. Well, you know what? We'll make it happen. I'll, we'll uh, it. We'll, we'll get you, I'll get you back in the dressing room so you can have a conversation with her. That would be, uh, she, she's unbelievable. 
she's a, I mean, she's a very good singer, uh, but she's a um, very good musician. I mean, the way she yeah. plays the violin is, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I don't play any instrument. I don't know how to read music at all, but I've been listening to music, you know, 40 hours, four hours a day for the last 50 years. So I know a lot of her music, which is a very well, good music. She is very good. And that's, uh, you know, a great thing that she brought to this band is a is a lead, n another lead instrument. Yeah. And she can play circles around us. She's, re she's really good at what she does. But she has got a very good personality and very outgoing. She talks, she makes jokes. People like that kind of stuff, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Other musician. I, mean, for, I think, um, I think maybe a lot of musicians are shy, but when they get on stage, you know, an, another personality might come out, but when they're off right. stage, they're yeah. a different person. That's I'm right. the same person. <laughs> the guy you see on stage is the guy you see walking down the street. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you a quick joke. Yeah. When my son was little, yeah, he said to me, Daddy, I want to grow up and be a musician. And my wife said to him, son, you can't do both. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. You can people either grow do what up they're or gonna you can do. be a musician. <laughs> that's right. People, um, people got to fulfill the dream, do what they like. I mean, in my case, uh, I knew that I couldn't play music. I, I knew that I have an expensive taste and buying music, going to concert. And I, I thought, you know, I need to, I need to study engineer that, I mean, it, it, go to university that will help me to get a better job and pay the bills. I went to graduate school and I, and, and I, and I did okay, man. I'm, I'm very fortunate, you know, to have a well-paying job in the day and, and then yeah. do the stuff and do the evening and buy music and go on gigs and, buying CDs, T-shirt, whatever, and uh, I'm, I'm a very fortunate. So the, as I mentioned before, this country has been very good to me and my family, so I cannot complain. And this is, there isn't another America in any galaxy, in any, yeah. you know, whatever is up there, man, you know, any Twilight Zone, you know, it's only America, it's only <laughs> one United States of America. So people that were born in here in this country, they, they need to earn it, man. They need to, like I did, and uh, they need to work hard and then they, Plenty of money for everybody. Plenty of this, a million dollars for everybody. You need to figure out how you get your, you know, your chunk out of the, the sky and, and do well for yourself, for your family, whatever, you know, and enjoy Well, I, I think um, my wife is a teacher. She teaches um, eight-year-olds, third grade. Yeah. And, uh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> and um, a lot of her students um, live in poverty. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they fall behind in school it, and it's hard to catch up when she's got, you know, 20, 25 students in a room and she's a very good teacher. Her, her, her kids love her yeah. because she loves them. Um, but s some of these kids are just not going to have a, a, get a, a good education because they need more help than just what one teacher can do. And I think educating people, um, is you know it paying for it now making mm -hmm. sure that children get a good education you don't pay for it later that's you right because yeah. because when you're educated you're making smart choices and and you're a nicer person for the most part yeah. um you know you you then you, when you're educated um you have more opportunity absolutely yeah available and um and then and then that leads to, you know, networking with other educated people. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it, it's easier. It's certainly, yeah. um, uh, I think what would be a good investment that uh, America make, it could make, you know, for its citizens is get the kids educated, start early, you know, but. Uh, they have know. good role models, you know, some, some kids, yes. unfortunately, they don't have both parts of the home and the mom needs to right. work and get yep. another part-time job and the kids are starting playing with computers and stay all night long. They don't do the homework because there's nobody at home telling them that school is important, read books, and that they, they, it's, it's crazy, you know. It, you, unfortunately, you, many broken families, you know. You are talking about her students and that's exactly what she has. She has, a, there's a lot of single parents or grandparents 
a lot of kids that are do not have any um, parameters set for them. They there's no one watching out for them or making sure they're doing their homework. You know, you, parents need to help. You know, the kids can't do it on their own at home, and if there's yeah. no supervision, like you said. She had a, just one poor kid. His father was shot to death and his mother's a drug addict. He's living with his grandmother and she can't take care of him. And he stays up all night playing Fortnite computer games. He's just wild, you know, these just crazy games that stimulate his brain so much. When he comes to school in the morning, he's tired and opening a book and reading it is just boring because his brain's been so stimulated from all this, you know, this comp computer games and stuff. And he, he was just, oh, it's, it's so sad. He's very sad, man, yeah. Kid. He's gonna end up, you know, on drugs, in jail or dead, probably by the time he's 18. Yeah, well, it's terrible, man, yeah. Yeah. It's terrible, yeah, right. I, for me, I, I got lucky on the way, man. I'm not as smarter than anybody else. I got, I knew there was school, it was important. And uh, and I got a bunch of degrees and still taking classes and I have done well in my life. So I have, a, it, it, I, I have a, a lot of motivation in my life. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not as smart as anybody else. I'm not as that I, I, I'm goal oriented and I have a lot of motivation. Although I'm, I'm old guy like too, but, um, but still I have inside me, I have a energy, you know, I have still the, yeah. the energy, the enthusiasm, uh, you know, uh, to do a lot more. I wish, I wish I had 40, 50 hours in the day to do a lot more. I mean, it's not, you know, I have a lot of goals. My life, you know? Yeah. Good for you. I'm like that as well. I'm very motivated to do stuff. Yeah, sometimes, that's, that's, you know, if you don't do it, like, nobody will do it for you, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, uh, I like to stay active, you know, I don't, I try to eat right when I can and, uh, and, uh, and I'd like to laugh a lot, you yeah. know, and I'm surrounded by really good friends. I'm yeah. really lucky that the life I've had, the parents, I had really good parents who were loving, you know, I had good, my, my siblings were great, um, you know. And the other thing is important, do, do the right thing in life and help people out. I mean, yes. you know, if you're a zillionaire or billionaire, what's the point of having a hundred house, a hundred car? No, make enough for yourself and for your kids, but give them money away. Do the right thing in life and help people out. And, you know, that's, uh, it's nothing wrong with making money. It just is something wrong with, and that is the only thing you do. Yeah. So I agree not, with you completely. Don't give back to, school or community or hospital or whatever, whatever it is, you know, you're, you're not, yeah. you're gonna help. I, I have done a lot that in my life and in a way I get energy back and now uh, I'm, you know, been fortunate to do other stuff because I tried to do the right thing in life, I suppose. We were, uh, we were just in Austin, Texas. And uh, after the show, we were uh, hanging out by the bus and uh, a homeless guy was walking by. So I just said, hello. And he sort of said, hello. And uh, I gave him a sandwich and uh, we started talking and he was from Jordan, a computer programmer. Wow. Came to America, lost his job. So I didn't, you know, was, he was, I think definitely had struggling with mental illness, you know, but he, you know, we had a nice long conversation and I gave him, you know, the, I had $50 in my pocket. So I gave him that. And uh, we had a really nice, really nice talk. And, uh, you know, I said, so where do you sleep? He said, outside. I, just, I said, no, where? He said, well, you know, you got to keep moving around. And he could, you knew, I could tell that he was a smart man. You know, he must have been uh, hard to tell, but maybe 30 very young huh? yeah yeah you know i mean he's very scruffy it's you know he hadn't shaved in i don't know how many years and you know in dirty clothes and uh but behind it you know there was a real person yeah. you know that was smart and you could tell he was passionate about things but he just for whatever reason um 
you know, he'd lost his place. Yeah, yeah, they gotta be opportunity for everybody, man. This, um, you know, everybody needs a second chance or a third chance or whatever, you know, as long as you're not doing stupid stuff or doing drugs, right. yeah, you know, not paying your taxes or whatever it is, and uh, yeah. everybody's in second opportunity, man. With life, in marriage, in music, in life, whatever it is, man. Yeah. You know, everybody goes to downturn, but you know, well, I gotta make it happen. Go to church if you believe in church, or yep. do the right thing, and say, good thing will happen to you. Man. That's what I, wherever you can find strength, you know. You know, I right. get I get it from my family and friends. For you, man. Yeah. Hey, Stephen. Was Stephen was very nice talking to you, man. I will see you in a couple of weeks, and don't forget to put me in the the in the, on list the guest list. Do you, will you do you come alone, or do you will you bring a guest with you? Uh, I'm. I may go with uh, with my son that they very lucky. Yeah, I will. Okay. He like the music. Put you, yeah. I'll put you down plus one. B U S T A M A N T E. Yeah. And you have my email address. With you you know. I will. All right. And I will send you a link for their recording after this. Thank you. It was very nice talking to you, Stephen. Uh, you're a you're a smart guy, man. And I need to talk to John. I didn't know he he had a a, a, a huge music collection, man. I need to talk to him. Man. Oh, he's he's. I need to see him. Incredible. His. You know, when we travel, he would, in the old days, he'd bring a box of his records and go to record stores and trade, you know, really? get other stuff. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 he had an incredible collection. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? I consider you a friend. So, my friend, I will see you at the Birchmere. You will, man. Thank you very much. You're a, you're a good guy, man. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. You too. Take it easy, man. Thank you all to your okay. family, and I will see you very soon, man. Okay. Bye-bye. Take it easy. Thank you.